Hello and welcome to Nidhrania Game Club. My name is Branislav Berec and you're watching Game in a Nutshell, the series of videos designed for teaching how to play various board games. Today we're going to learn how to play High Rise, game by Gilhova, published by Formal Ferret Games, and it's a game for one to four players. There are small differences for a two-player games, and I will talk about those differences at the end of the video. And since it's a one to four player game, I will also explain how to play this game solo at the very end of this video. To set up the game, place the game board in the middle of the table. For a four player game, use the game board with this side up, and for the one to three player games, use this side of the game board. Then place this victory point and corruption board next to the game board. Place all these floor tiles into the bag and create the general supply of this ultra plastic material, which never goes into the bag. Separate these blueprint cards into piles for 2010, 2020 and 2030. Now, the game can be played in three different modes. In the introductory and the standard game, you will not need these 2010 blueprints. In a full game, you will need all three piles. So. Shuffle each pile separately, then in the introductory and the standard game, you will only play two rounds of the game. So randomly choose one 2020 and 2030 blueprint cards and place them face up next to the game board. Place these blueprint blocker tiles next to the 2020 blueprint card, because that's the first round of the game. In the full game, you will play three rounds, starting with 2010, then 2020, and you can choose the random 2030 blueprint card at the end of the first round. Again, place these blueprint blocker tiles under the 2010 blueprint card, because that's going to be the first round of the game. Now, separate these bonus tiles based on the round number on the back. And as with the blueprint cards, if you play the introductory or standard game, you will not need these 2010 bonus tiles, and you can place them back into the box. Then. Take these 2020 bonus tiles, shuffle them, and place one face up bonus tile on each of these square bonus spaces. Don't place any tiles on these pre printed spaces. When you're done, place all the remaining bonus tiles back into the box. Keep this pile of 2030 tiles nearby, you will place them on the game board at the start of the next round. If you play the full game, First, place these 2010 tiles on the game board at the start of the first round, and you will deal these 2020 tiles at the start of the second round and 2030 tiles at the start of the third round. Now, if any of the bonus tiles, including these pre printed tiles, have this floor with a question mark icon, choose one random floor from the bag and place it on that tile. If the tile shows this ultra plastic icon, place one ultra plastic material on that tile. Since this pre-printed tile shows two floor icons with the question mark, draw two random floors and place them on the tile. If the tile shows the card with a number, find all power cards with the same number and place them somewhere next to that bonus tile. There's no need to place anything on any other type of bonus tile. Now distribute the tenant tiles to these spaces in each neighborhood, like East Gardens, Bayside Heights, City Center, and so on and so forth. Separate the tenant tiles by their back, and for the introductory game, find all tenant tiles with this orange corner from each neighborhood, and place them randomly on the first three spaces in the neighborhood. And if you play a four-player game, cover the last space with this blocker tile and this needs to be done for each neighborhood on the game board. For the standard game, you can take all the tenant tiles, randomly choose three of them, and place them again in a random order on the first three spaces of the neighborhood, still covering the four space with the blocker tile if you play the four player game. And when you play the full game, place the tenant tiles on all spaces in each neighborhood. You can return the unused tenant tiles back into the box, you will not need them. When you block the tenant spaces with these blocker tiles, also block this corresponding neighborhood spaces with these neighborhood blocker tiles. Those spaces will not be available for the rest of the game. Similar to bonus tiles, if those tenant tiles have any cards with a number, 
locate those cards in the deck and place them nearby. Then each player chooses a color and takes all the bases and markers of the same color. Take these base construction yards and if you play a three player game, remove this player number four construction yard from the game. In a two player game, only use the player number one and player number two construction yards and in a solo game, you will only use this one. Deal one of these base construction yards randomly to each player. If you play the introductory and the standard game, use these standard game side up. If you play the full game, use the other side, which is designed for the full game. In the introductory and the standard game, each player randomly draws one floor and places it on this space in the construction yard. When you play the full game, only the fourth player in a player order draws one random floor and places it in their construction yard. All players place one of their markers, called Mogul, on one of the spaces in this stop zone. The player with this player number one base construction yard places their marker on the number one in this stop zone, the player number two places their marker on the second spot, and so on and so forth. Then each player places one of their markers on the zero space on the scoring track, and in the introductory game, all players start on this minus two corruption space. Then in the standard game, the first player starts in the minus one space, the last player in the minus three space, and all other players in this minus two space. And in the full game, all players start on the zero space of the corruption track. Finally, Every player takes a five-story building and slots it into one of their bases. And then the first player in a player order places their building next to the tenant with the same number in a top right corner. Then that tenant tile is immediately activated, which means the white player would take this power card and place it in front of them. Then the second player in a player order would place their building next to the tenant with the number two. The third player in a player order places their building next to the tenant with the number three, again activating that tile. And the fourth player in a player order would also do the same. In the standard game, in the reversed player order, so starting with the last player, players would place their buildings into any unoccupied neighborhood except for the city center and then immediately activate the tenant which corresponds to that place. Unoccupied neighborhood is a neighborhood where there's no building yet. If, after placing the building, the player would gain a power card, they would place that card in front of them. You can find the description of all the tenant powers in the rulebook. In the full game, players don't get any starting buildings and obviously they don't place them on the game board. The game is played in rounds and you play two rounds in the introductory and the standard game and three rounds in the full game. Each round you will move your mogul along this rondel track and take an action at the spot you stop in. When you reach the stop zone again, your round is over. When all players reach that stop zone, the entire round will be over. The turn order in this game is variable and it's always the player who is furthest behind who is the next to go. So in this example, since the yellow player is the furthest behind, it's the yellow player's turn. If the yellow player would move to this spot and take an action at this location, since they are still the furthest behind, it would be again the yellow player's turn. During the round, players will collect these floors of various colors. They will also collect this ultra plastic, which is some sort of a super modern material and acts as a wild material in the game. And players will use these materials to construct buildings in these neighborhoods based on the blueprints. Building these buildings is the main source of victory points in the game and also the tallest building in each neighborhood and across the entire board would score additional bonus points. Now, in order to take some actions or to supercharge some other actions, you will have to take Corruption, which is tracked over here. Talking strictly about this game, you will have to use some Corruption. However, the player with the most Corruption will suffer penalties at the end of each round and also at the end of the game.
The game board is a one-way rondel track and players move clockwise. These white and grey spaces are action spaces and they are grouped into zones. All players start the round in this stop zone and at the end of the round they will also end their round in the stop zone. On your turn, if you are the player who is furthest behind, you can take your mogul and move into a different zone and to action space which is not occupied by another player. You can move several zones ahead, however, you may not stop on this blocker tile. You have to move to the different zone, so you are not allowed to take an action in the same zone. When you move to an action space, the action is mandatory. You have to be able to take that action in order to move to that action space. The only exception is the stop zone, where you have to stop, but all these actions are optional. Now, in this section of the video, I will explain what actions you can perform on the game board. When you take an action with these symbols, this one, the floor with the question mark, allows you to draw one random floor from the bag. You store the floor in your construction yards. Each space can contain maximum one floor or one ultra plastic. This symbol without a question mark allows you to choose a floor of any color from the bag and add it to your construction yard. And this floor symbol in the brackets indicates that it's an optional action. However, this small briefcase symbol indicates that you have to take one corruption for that action. Now, when you take this action, you have to take specifically the red floor. In this case, it would be the gray floor from the back. When you take this action, you can take one ultra plastic from the general supply. This swap floors or trade floor symbol indicates that you can take as many floors as you like of the same color, place them in the bag, and take that number of floors of a different single color. If you ever get more material than you have spaces in your construction yard, you have to make a choice immediately, even if it's not your turn. You can either discard down to your capacity and keep the same storage space, or you can take an expanded construction yard. However, you have to pay for that and you have to pay with corruption. If you take it in 2010, which only happens in the full game, you have to pay 3 corruption. If you take it during the 2020 round, you have to pay 2 corruption, and if you take it in 2030 round, you only need to pay 1 corruption. I'll talk about the corruption in a minute. You're not limited to just one expanded construction yard. If you exceed your capacity again, you can buy additional construction yards, again paying the corruption, and then placing your newly acquired materials to these new expanded construction yards. If players would hoard too many floors of the same color, and let's say you would need to draw one red floor from the bag, but there's no red floor in the bag, you can take that floor from the player who has most of these floors. If that player would be you, well, you would get nothing. Some action spaces have this briefcase symbol, some of them have the small briefcase symbol, and there are some action spaces with the briefcase symbol crossed with a red line. Anytime you take an action with this corruption symbol, count the number of briefcases and move your marker that many spaces towards the higher negative numbers. So if I would move to this space with two briefcases, I would have to move two spaces. If I would take this action, I would only pay corruption if I decide to take this part of the action. Now, anytime you take this action, you can lose corruption, which means you can move that many spaces towards the zero. However, remember that you have to be able to take that action in order to move to that action space. So if the yellow player's corruption would be zero, he would not be allowed to take this action because there is no corruption to lose. At the end of each round, the player with the most corruption would lose some victory points or in a full game, they would have to flip one of their power cards face down. At the end of the game, all players lose victory points equal to the space with their marker. These bonus spaces give bonuses to any player who passes them. 
you are never allowed to stop on these bonus spaces. When you pass over these bonus spaces, take everything from one space and you have to fully resolve this bonus space before you move to the action spot. So in this case, you would have to make decision whether you discard the material or take an expanded construction yard. And only after that, you can resolve the action spot where you stopped in. And even if you pass over multiple bonus spaces, you can still take only one of them. However, you have wider options. When you take everything from the bonus tile, discard the tile back into the box. When you take this power card, discard the tile and place the power card face up in front of you. Those empty bonus spaces will remain empty until the end of the round. When you stop on the action space with this tenant tile, you must activate that tile immediately. You will either get some immediate bonus, like in this case, or you will take the power card. You can find the detailed description of every single tenant tile in the rulebook. When you stop on the tenant tile with the building, the owner of that building would draw one random floor from the back. If you stop on the tenant tile with your building, you may draw one random floor from the back, but you have to pay one corruption. When you gain the power card, place it in front of you. Each power card has an indication when and how frequently you can use them. Power cards with this symbol can be used once per round. When you use them, flip them face down. Power cards with this infinite symbol have a permanent effect and they are never flipped face down. Power cards with this one-time symbol are only one-time use and after you use them, return the card back to the supply deck, do not remove them from the game. And power cards with this symbol have the end game effect. There's no limit to the number of cards you can have and you can even have multiple cards with the same name. However, if you use multiple copies of the same card during the same action, using the first one is for free, but any extra of the same name will cost you one corruption. So if I would use the third card with the same name in the same action, I would pay two corruption total. Then if there's no power card available for the tenant tile, you can still move to that tenant tile and activate it. However, you will not get that power card. Let me just reiterate that the power cards with this one-time symbol after being used are returned back to the supply next to the tenant tile. When you take the construction action, you must discard the exact combination of floors from your construction yard that matches the blueprint of the current round. You may not match the blueprint from the next round. It's only visible so that you can plan ahead. So in order to build this building, you have to discard one purple, one gray, and one blue floor. This ultra plastic is a wild resource and you can use it to replace any other floor. So if you wouldn't have the purple floor in this case, you can use the ultra plastic to replace the purple floor, then take the gray floor and the blue floor. Ultra plastic is a super special wild resource, so you can even use any floor to replace the ultra plastic from the blueprint. So to build this building, I can use this blue floor, gray floor, red floor, now black. Now to replace the black floor, I can use the ultra plastic. And then instead of the ultra plastic, I can use any other floor from my construction yard. Now, the number of floors and ultra plastic you spend determines the height of your building. This would be a six story building, and that would be the number of victory points I would score immediately, which is marked on this scoring track. Now, there are a few ways how to increase the height of your building. If you are the first player to build the blueprint in a round, you get one additional floor. To indicate that the blueprint has been already built, place this blueprint blocker tile under the blueprint. Other players can still build the same building, however, they would not get this additional floor. Then if you use ultra plastic to match the ultra plastic from the blueprint, you also get additional floor. So in this case, the initial height of the building is five. However, I get the plus one bonus because I'm the first to build a blueprint in a round. And since I also match ultra plastic from the blueprint, 
that's additional bonus floor, so the height of my building would be 7. You don't have to match the entire blueprint, just the ultra plastic. If I would use ultra plastic to replace any floor from the blueprint, however, I match the ultra plastic floor, I still get that bonus. After choosing the blueprint and discarding the material, take the building tile matching the height of your building, including the extra floors, slot that building tile into one of your bases, score the indicated number of victory points, and place your new building in any neighborhood on the game board. However, if it's not the same neighborhood as the neighborhood of the construction zone, in this case downtown, you have to take one corruption. Since the city center doesn't have any special construction zone, it will always cost you one corruption to build there. In addition, you may never build on these blocked spaces. Then after placing the building, you may, you're not required, but you may activate the tenant connected to the building. You activate that tenant after you build the building, so if the tenant would give you any floors, you cannot use those floors to build that building. If the neighborhood is full, you can demolish the shortest building in that neighborhood, but only if your new building is taller than that shortest building in this neighborhood. You can even demolish your own building. The owner of the demolished building draws two random floors from the back, and they don't lose any victory points because of the demolished building. If your neighborhood is full and you don't want to demolish a building, or if your new building is not taller than the shortest building in that neighborhood, you can build in the suburbs. That means you will not place the building on the game board, you will simply score the number of victory points on the scoreboard. At the very end of your turn, if you have any of these penthouse cards, you can discard that card together with three floors from your construction yard and you can add those floors to any one of your buildings. If you have more than one penthouse card, you can play them all at the same time, but don't forget that for each additional one, you have to pay one corruption. Obviously, you have to discard those floors as well. You can use these penthouse cards even at the end of the turn, in which you did not perform the construction action. You can add these penthouse floors to one building, or if you use multiple cards, you can split them to multiple buildings, but keep in mind that all three floors from one card have to be applied to one building. You don't score any victory points for these penthouses, and you don't activate the tenants. These penthouses only help you win the tallest building bonus. When you acquire this spire bonus, take one of these spires and place it into your reserve. If you would claim this bonus, you would obviously add two spires into your reserve. Now, when you take the construction action, and only when you take the construction action, you may place these spires on the newly constructed building. You can even place multiple spires on the same building, however, they don't score the victory points, they don't count for this high elevator bonus card, they only help you win the tallest building bonus. When you move to the stop zone, you have to stop in the first available action space. Unlike other action spaces, actions in the stop zone are optional. After that, your round is over and you have to wait for other players to get to the stop zone as well. When all players reach the stop zone, the round is over. Action spaces also determine the starting player order for the next round. The end of the round procedure has three steps. First, Perform the upkeep, which doesn't happen in 2030, which is the end of the game. Then award bonuses for tallest buildings. And third, players will take penalties for corruption. During upkeep, players flip their face down power cards face up. This doesn't happen during the 2030, which is end of the game. Then discard the blueprint for the current round. Take the blocker tiles and place them next to the next round blueprint card and then discard that blueprint card. If you play the full game and it's the end of 2010, randomly draw one 2030 card. Then discard any remaining bonus tiles from the current round and then distribute the new bonus tiles for the next round on all empty bonus spaces in the same way as you do during the setup. Then award bonus points for tallest buildings. First, the tallest buildings in each neighborhood will score victory points. 
then the tallest building across the whole board will score additional bonus points. Spires do count for this bonus. You can find these bonuses on the construction card. If you play the full game in 2010, the tallest building in each neighborhood will score one victory point. Then in 2020, the tallest building in each neighborhood and then the tallest building across the whole board would score two victory points and the second tallest buildings would score one victory point. Now the game uses something called ultra-friendly ties. That means if there are multiple buildings tied for the same place, all those buildings score the victory points. So in East Gardens, this player would score two victory points for the tallest building in that neighborhood, and these two buildings would score one victory point each for the second tallest buildings in that neighborhood. It doesn't matter that the owner is the same player. That player would simply score two victory points. Similarly, when scoring the whole board, these two buildings, the nine-story buildings, each would score two victory points for their owner, and then these three buildings, the eight-story buildings, each of them would score one victory point for their owner. In 2030, again, all the neighborhoods will be scored and then the entire board, and the tallest building would score three victory points, second tallest buildings would score two victory points, and then third tallest buildings would score one victory point. In addition, at the very end of the game, you also score one victory point for any three leftover floors in your construction yard, rounded up. So for these eight leftover floors, I would score additional three victory points. And finally, there's this thing with the corruption. As these icons on the construction cards indicate, at the end of 2010 and 2020, the player with the fewest victory points would lose two corruption. So with this example, the white player is the player with the fewest victory points, so that player would lose two corruption. Then the player with the second fewest victory points would lose one corruption. So this green player would lose one corruption. Don't forget about this ultra-friendly tie rule. If these two players would be the players with the fewest victory points, they would both lose two corruption, and both these players would lose one corruption. Then the player with the most corruption will take some penalty now. In the introductory and the standard game, what this iconology means is that the player with the most corruption will lose one victory point for each space that that player has to move towards the player with the second most corruption. So for four spaces, yellow player would lose four victory points. If there are more players with the most corruption, all these players would have to move to the player with the second most corruption, and both yellow and green player would lose four victory points. If you play the full game, the player with the most corruption has to flip one of their power cards face down. It can be any power card, even the card which is only for the one-time use. It's not discarded, it's just flipped face down. So that card is unavailable for the entire next round. Then, at the end of 2030, the corruption penalties are slightly different. First, all players lose victory points equal to the level of their corruption. So the yellow player would lose 19 victory points, red player would lose 15 victory points, white player would lose 12, and green player would lose 9. Then the player with the most corruption would lose additional 3 victory points, and the player with the second most corruption would lose additional 1 victory point. So the yellow player would lose additional 3 points, and red player 1 point. After that, the player with the most points is the winner. Anytime during the game, if your score exceeds 40 victory points, take this tile, place it somewhere in front of you, and continue along the scoring track. When you play a two-player game, always play the full game. Use these player number one and player number two base construction yards, and use them with this full game side up. In addition, you will also need the neutral mogul. Take two discs of the color which is not used by any player, leave one of those discs in front of the player number two, and take the second disc and place it on the third space in the stop zone. Both players will alternate taking control of this neutral mogul, and the second marker indicates which player is currently controlling that neutral mogul. Similar to human players, Neutral Mogul will take turn when it's furthest behind on this rondel track. 
The player who controls the neutral mogul will use that mogul in two ways, either to block or to move. At the end of the turn, the control passes to the other player. Now, when the controlling player decides to block with the neutral mogul, move the neutral mogul to the first available space in the zone which is in front of the leading player. You will not take that action, you will simply block that action space. If the leading player would be in this zone, then the next zone in front of this player is this, so the neutral mogul would move to this action space. When the neutral mogul comes to the stop zone, place it in the first available space in that stop zone. When you decide to move the neutral mogul, you can not only move him, but also take an action at the spot you stop in, as if you would take that action with your own mogul. However, if you choose this option, first gain one corruption, and then you can move the neutral mogul to any legal space in his current neighborhood or the next neighborhood. Neighborhoods are actually differentiated by the color and the graphics, so all these action spaces are part of the Bayside Heights, these action spaces, including the construction action spaces, are part of the East Gardens. These action spaces are part of the Harborside neighborhood and these belong to downtown. When you move your mogul and take the action with it, you gain one corruption for this option. And then, if you gain any other corruption, one or more corruption during that action, you have to lose one victory point. When the neutral mogul stops on a tenant space with a building, that player can draw one floor, however, similar to standard rules, if the controlling player is the player who owns that building, if that player draws the floor, they also have to gain one corruption. Neutral mogul never picks up the bonus tiles. The first human player who passes over a set of bonus tiles takes everything from one space, and then discards everything from the other space. If you jump over several sets of bonus tiles, again, only take everything from one of those bonus tiles and discard everything from the second tile in the same set, bonus tiles from other sets remain on the game board. At the end of the round, when adjusting corruption, the player with the fewer victory points will lose two corruption in case the difference in victory points is 6 or more. If the difference is 5 or fewer, the player with the fewer victory points only loses one corruption. The player with the most victory points does not lose any corruption. Then apply the corruption penalty as normal in a full game, so the player with the most corruption has to flip one of their cards face down for the entire next round. If both players would have the same level of corruption, there is an exception to the ultra-friendly tie here, and neither player has to flip the card. In a solo game, you will always play the full game and take this player number one base construction yard. Place your mogul on the number one spot in the stop zone, and you will use two neutral moguls, and they can be of any color. Then, don't place any bonus tiles on the game board, Instead, randomly draw six of them and place them in this kind of a line next to the stop zone. Then randomly draw three floors and place them next to those bonus tiles. Now, prepare the neutral buildings following the table in the rulebook. Take five shortest buildings, so those are these three five-story buildings and two six-story buildings, and place the shortest building in the first available space in East Gardens. Then place the next shortest building in the first available space in Harborside, then continue to Downtown, Bayside Heights, and finally the last building goes to the city center, to the space which neighbors the Bayside Heights. Place the blueprint blocker tiles in the first construction zone, which is the East Gardens zone. Both neutral moguls work in the exact same way as in a two player game. You can use them to block first available space in the zone in front of the leading mogul, and so if this would be the leading mogul and you would decide to block with this mogul, you would simply move him to this space, or you can use the mogul to move and take an action, which means you can place it on any action space, legal action space in the same neighborhood or in the next neighborhood. If any mogul stops on the space with a neutral building, 
nothing special happens. If you move your Mogul over a set of bonus spaces ahead of both of the neutral Moguls, choose and take any of the remaining bonus tiles, and if you choose floors, you can choose one of the floors from the display, and then immediately refill the display from the bag. When you're done, discard the bonus tile. If any neutral mogul is the first one to pass over the set of bonus spaces, discard the bonus tile which is closest to the corner of the game board, or lowest bonus tile, without any effect. The first time each round, when any mogul stops in or passes by a construction zone, you must place a blueprint blocker tile on the blueprint card. If you use the mogul to actually build a building, and you build a building for the first time this round, let's say it would be this building, find the blueprint blocker tile with the same letter and cover the bonus below that building. Otherwise, shuffle the blocker tiles and cover the space with the same letter. Then move those blocker tiles to the next construction zone as a reminder. However, if any mogul stops in or passes a tenant tile with the construction power, do not place any blocker tiles on the blueprint card. As soon as only one blueprint without a blocker tile remains, the number at the bottom of that blueprint sets the end of the round corruption limit. Place the marker of any other color on that space. At the end of the round, score the tallest buildings as usual, and then compare your corruption marker to the corruption limit marker. If you have fewer corruption than the limit, then for each space, which is a difference between those markers, score one victory point. If you have more corruption than the limit, then for each space difference, lose three victory points. Then take the next five shortest buildings from the neutral buildings and place them in their neighborhoods in the same way as you did during the setup. So take the shortest building and place it in the first available space in East Gardens, then the next shortest buildings goes to the first available space in Harborside, then downtown, Bayside Heights, and then in the city center, start from the space which neighbors the Bayside Heights and then go in a clockwise direction. So the next building would go here. If the neighborhood is full, replace the shortest building in the neighborhood, and if there is a tie, replace the one which is closest to the first space of that neighborhood. If you replace your own building, you can draw two random floors from the bag. Then if there are any remaining bonus tiles, remove those tiles from the game and draw six new tiles for the next round. At the end of the game, tally up your scores and if you reach 70 victory points or more, you win the game. For more details, consult this table in the rulebook. So that's it, that's how you play High Rise. If you would have any questions or comments, please put them into the comment sections below. I'll be happy to answer your questions. If you like the series, please subscribe. My name is Branislav Berec, you've been watching Game in a Nutshell, and hope to see you next time.